So blessed to have everybody this morning. Matt and Becca are elders here in the church. Matt and Becca have been such an incredible blessing to us. And God just did a miracle in Becca's body this year. I'm telling you, she, uh, I mean, in the natural, I mean, doctors were saying there's going to take a miracle. Well, you're looking at a miracle. And the Lord has healed her. And uh, it's just incredible. So it's exciting. So Matt is going to share with you guys this morning. Give him a good hand as he comes. Thank you. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here. But, like, even if I'm sitting over there, I just look at it like, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here. You know, because anybody can stand up here. You already got it. You know, like Andrew Womack said, you already got it. You might not know it yet, but you already got it. You know, um, (laughs) I can stand here and just honestly say, I didn't think I'd make it this long. Like, I'm about to be 58. When I was 25, I was like, man, ain't no way I'm going to hit 30. Living like I'm living. right some of you been there some of you haven't but the reason I'm here is because perseverance the the reason that I tell my wife all the time I'm ever living one y'all are too like we can't die so that whole fear of death thing left me a long time ago you know when I was living in the streets and I was running I still believed in God. I still believed that no matter what happened, I was going to be with my maker. Because it said, whosoever believes upon me will have everlasting life. It didn't say whosoever followed all the rules. Come on. No, I'm not saying that that's not a good thing, right? It didn't say whosoever had the, the, the best denomination with the right doctrine. Right? Said whosoever. Man, I ran them streets hard. (laughs) Like y'all wouldn't recognize me. And it's not something to be proud of, but it it is something to look back on and go, man, thank God. Like, thank God for that little wisp of hope, that little wisp of belief, right? That, That drew me to my maker in my time of need, right? Like, I was the CEO of Jesus Incorporated. When, when anything happened, like, that was wrong in my life, I'd incorporate them into it. There, there was no worship in my life. Like, I had no worship. I, I had no grid of what worship was. Yet I was worshiping, okay? I was worshiping the lifestyle, you know, 18, 19 years old. Man, I, I, I pretty much had it made as far as things that I wanted to do and, and just lust for life, you know. I, I'd surf, man. I, 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 I like that was, I worshiped that. I, I worshiped surfing. I worshiped the recognition that it got me in, in, my, in my state. But I still believed in Jesus. I was just worshiping the wrong thing. Right? And, and, and in my lust for satisfying myself, I ended up killing myself. I ended up dying. Like just little pieces of who God created me to be, right? Into who I thought I should be, you know, and who I thought would be, you know. So I identified myself that way in what I did, not in who I was created to be. Right? Is this all right? Is this okay? You know? And so, man, I'm just going to be real. I told my brother-in-law, I said, if I die tomorrow, 
I was 23 years old. I said, if, if I die tomorrow, I know I've lived a good life, and I know where I'm going. Now, I might not have done the right things all the time, but, but there's grace. There's mercy. And he looked at me and said, why are you talking like that? I said, man, I, don't, I was in a bad way. And, and it wasn't... I wasn't so far gone that I couldn't humble, that, that, that like it drove me to humble myself and, and tell somebody where I was at, right? It's just I knew my conscience. I knew where I was at wasn't right, right? So um, knowing who you're in, you are in Christ, like I didn't know who I was. <laughs> like I said, man, I, I, just, I just wanted to live the life. Like MTV when I was a kid, that I seen the first time they brought it on, right? And they show this lifestyle. It's perverted, man. You know? And, and they'd show this lifestyle of what, what they think that young people should attain to so that they can market things, right? For the, for the use of evil. You know, and I'd look at this, and because I was a, a, of a young mind, I'd like, yeah, that's what it's like. Yeah, that's, the, that's what that's. And I had desires, right, but they were all for the wrong things. I had a desire to be somebody, but it wasn't a desire to be who God created me to be. Because I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know. I, I grew up in a broken home, but like I never want, I can't sit here and say, oh yeah, I mean, I'm not a victim. You know, I, I was at one time. In my eyes, I was a victim. And, and, it, and all it did was allow me to chaps, just to like stack chips on my shoulder. You know? It, it just allowed me to, to justify, right, things that I was doing wrong because of wrong things that were done to me. And there's no justification in that, man. So knowing who you are in Christ means you believe what God says about you. It's truer than what any el anybody else says about you including yourself. So I'm going to read that again. Knowing who you are in Christ means you believe what God says about you is truer than what anyone else says about, says about you, including yourself. Right? So how do we get there? <laughs> Too often we place our identities on what we do and what we've done or even what's been done to us. By doing that, we significantly limit not only ourselves, but Christ in us and what Christ can do for us. It, it, I can sit here and woe is me, you know, and I'm a sinner and saved by grace, and I, I can't be both. I'm saved by grace. I may sin, right, but in my relationship when I do, Right, it's like brought to my attention, right, and and I immediately, okay, Lord, you got to forgive me. Right? And not only do you, do you got to forgive me, like I got to change the way I think because that's not right. You know what I'm saying? Um, the enemy can get a foothold in our lives if we don't know who God created us to be. Okay, and, and, and a foothold, a stronghold, it, it actually means a place. He, he can have a place in your life. You know, and, and even Jesus in Matthew 18, at the end he says, my Father in heaven will turn you over to the tormentors if you don't forgive. You know, forgiveness is, is an attribute of holiness, right? So, so I believe unforgiveness is a sin. And, and, and oftentimes it uh, brings us to a place to where we justify, to where we become victims, and we have a victim. Man, there's, there is no such thing as a perfect victim. 
And, and my story, I got to remind myself all the time, man, I can't make my story bigger than his. Right? Oh, woe is me. You know, I, I mean, Jesus, when he went to the upper room, he wasn't like, man, you should have seen the way they were whipping me, bro. You know? Like, that, that wasn't even on his mind. What was on his mind was others and how he was going to empower them, right, to bring the gospel, which was through the Holy Spirit. He never said, oh, you know, Pontius Pilate, he knew who I was. He could have, you know what I mean? But we copped that attitude a lot, right? Well, you don't know what they've done to me. There's about a lot of things that's been done to me that, that I don't even know was done to me because God in his sovereign grace, like, erased that until I'm strong enough to deal with it, you know? Um, so, yeah, taking our thoughts captive, persevering, being steadfast. I might not have been living right, but I never lost my faith. <laughs> and my faith brought me to back to my first love. And, and, and it's because of the drawing of the love of God, of the love of Jesus that, that draws us to him, right? That, that, that it put a yearning inside me. To, to know him more personally. Like, as a kid, I grew up, my dad was a pastor. I seen things in the church, you know I mean? Growing up in the church, we've been hurt. It, people say church hurt. I, I just call it people hurt, you know? But, but we can take that thing and run with it, and, and, and all of a sudden we're running and we're running with it, and we're so far from God, and it wasn't one, him that hurt us. It was somebody that, Right? Look at it. <laughs> the key to perseverance, the key to steadfastness, is the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit, because that's what gives you relationship with Jesus. That's what gives you relationship with Jesus to, to, to where you can see the Father. Right? So I, I can sit there and Man, the bottom line is it's the Holy Spirit, okay? I, I was in prison, right? And I was going to church, right? 18 years old, I get arrested, um, made a bad choice. So I'm in prison. I was, I'd been there about a year. I didn't have much time left. Um, I told my sister, I said, look, when I get to my, my destination, the, the, the state prison that I'm going to be in, like, I don't want you to tell dad where I'm at. Not that I don't love him, not that I just didn't want, I, I, I said, I, I really don't want any visitors. You, you have to, like, write your name on a visitor's, li to allow visitors to come see you. I don't know how it is in Arkansas, that's the way it was in Florida. If your name wasn't on someone's list, you're not going in. Lawyers can go in, pastors can go in, just family, no, right? So, so like, for a year I hadn't seen anybody, but I was going to church, uh, Awesome man, filled with the Holy Spirit. I come from a Methodist background. I, I didn't have a grid for that. I mean, what I read and what my dad explained to me, he wasn't against it, but, like, I, I just didn't have a grid. I didn't have any understanding, you know. But Jesus always gives his disciples gifts before he gives them understanding. Right? So, so you look, before he taught them on healing, he had them go heal. All right? So, uh, Right? He didn't explain what the Holy Spirit he says. I got to go in order to send you the Holy Spirit, which is going to be your helper. But it, that's not understanding. Okay. Is there any? Right? 
So, so I had no grid on that, but this pastor from Tampa, um, he was a vineyard pastor. I knew he was baptized in the Holy Spirit because I, I heard him speak in tongues one time real quietly. Right? But he didn't want to dishonor the gift. It, it, the gift to him wasn't there for him to be spiritualized above people. It was for him to have connection with Jesus. <laughs> Y'all getting that? So this guy comes up and he's like, hey, we want, we want to just interview you guys. And it's right before Christmas and he's, he's interviewing people and he says, I, I want to talk to you. There was about 10 of us in the group and um, even though you're in prison and like you need Jesus more than anything, only 10 of us show up. <laughs> this guy came up to me and he said, uh, he said, what's your, where are you from? I told him where I was from. He said, what's, what's your dad's name and your mom's name? So I told him, he goes, like all of a sudden he just stopped and he looked at me and he goes, your dad goes to my church. I said, no, nah, there's no way my dad goes to your church. You know? I said, he's, he's a Methodist pastor and he's not filled with the Holy Spirit and I know you are. And he goes, really? He got all excited. How'd you know? I said, I see it on you. I see it on you. Like, he didn't let that go. Like, even though I told him, no, it can't be my dad, like, he never let that go. Because he knew he heard it from the Holy Spirit. And he knows the Holy Spirit's the spirit of truth. Right? So he goes back to his church, looks for my dad, finds my dad. Hey, I think I saw your son. Is your son in prison by chance? Yeah. Is he? He goes, well, I don't know. Like, I don't know where he is, but I do know he's in. And he goes, well, I've seen your son. <laughs> he's doing really good. And he's in church. And uh, so like that encouraged my dad. Right? Because the Holy Spirit's an encourager. But more than that, like he told my dad, look, you're a pastor? He said, you can go see him. So my dad shows up, biggity bam, right? <laughs> Saturday, visitation. Everybody's happy, Right? A buddy of mine comes up and says, hey, man. He says, you got a visitor. I said, no, nah, I don't. He said, yeah, you do. He said, they just called your name. You got a visitor. I said, I don't have nobody on my list, bro. Unless it's a lawyer, I don't have no visitor. He goes, man, I'm telling you, they called your name. They called your number. I was like, ah, okay. Just trying not to argue here. Just then, I was like, Shh, here, I go see my dad. It was an amazing homecoming. It was like, like God knows when you need encouraged, right, when you need it, you know? But I, I, I say all that to say this. This guy knew the voice of the Holy Spirit. And no matter what I told him, no matter what anybody else told him, that trumped all. That trumped all. And he went back to his church, and he found my dad. And he said, hey. Like, he wasn't like, hey, I can get you to go there. I can. He's like, I just want you to know he's doing good. And the promise that God has, though they may stray, they'll always come back. He said, that promise is holding true for your son. Now, as a father, I prayed that prayer. And, Lord, you promised, you said, right? We're all going to go through trials. E even, man, even the most godly men I know, like, have been through trials. I mean, anyone in this room that's been following Christ has been through trials. And the enemy likes to use those to pull you out of your identity, to make you doubt the Father's love for you. See, I, I used to do it for what I thought I could get, right? 
and say, well, you know, I was a CEO of Jesus. I was incorporated. I just like incorporated him whenever I was in trouble. And I never, I looked at it as what I could get, not who I could be. I, I didn't look at it as an opportunity for me to be a son. I never looked at it as, a, I mean, you know, early 80s, you, you got that whole prosperity message, you know, and man, I'm not against it, it's biblical, you know, but it was preached and taught in such a way that it perverted the grace of God to the point to where it perverted our desires in which to seek God. Instead of seeking them for a relationship, instead of seeking them for, seeking for what I could get, right? Not what I could be. Not what I could do for him. See, I was always about self. Man, and daily I try to, I try to die to self, you know, because it's what kills you. Selfishness. What kills you is what kills relationships. The whole me, 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 me. Oh. So, <laughs> my wife uh, got this word, I believe it was the beginning of this year, and God said, I'm going to stand in the fire with you. Is that what he said? I'll be the fourth man in the fire with you. I'll be the fourth man in the fire with you. And she shared this with me, and she goes, what do you think that means? I said, I don't know. I said, but there's been many times that he's been the fourth man in the fire for me. So I have no doubt about that. Um, but we didn't know what was coming. And sometimes God gives me a word for others, and, and sometimes I seek one. Right? Sometimes they just come. Sometimes I seek one. I was driving home from working on our retreat center, and, and I said, God, I just, I just really need a word to encourage my wife. And he said, okay. And I said, what is that word? He said, steadfast. I didn't know what it meant. I said, well, what does that mean, steadfast? He said, tell her, she's, tell her she's steadfast. I said, okay. I didn't know what it meant. See, sometimes they'll give you an answer just to, like, make you more inquisitive. Right? Um, steadfast, unmovable. Never losing faith. This was after we found out she had cancer. Um, I come home from work. And uh, she had went to the doctor. The doctor said, there's something that, like, I... Uh, I'm going to have to send you to a smarter doctor than me. That's the doctor's exact words, right? She said, I, I found something, and you're going to, you're, we need to send you. So she goes to, the, she asked her, what, what, uh, what kind of doctor would you like, a male or a female? She said, I just want a doctor that's going to, um, that hears from God. And she goes, okay. So she sends us to this doctor. First time we walked in, square skirt, sneakers. 
run up to there. I'm like, oh, yeah, this girl hears from God. <laughs> Just a joke. So apparently while I was at work, Becca got an email or a call, and I come home, and I don't see her, but her car's there, and I'm, you know, hey, where you at? Where you at? I walk in our spare bedroom, and she's on the floor on her face. And, like, immediately I knew. And she said, I got some news. And in that moment, I was mad. I, I've been serving God. And I was mad. I didn't know who to put my anger towards, but I was mad. And I believe cancer is, is demonic in the sense that its only job is to kill, steal, and destroy. Okay? So I was mad. I prayed with her. I uh, probably got a little reclusive. Because <laughs> sometimes when things are going on in my life, like, I, I don't pull away to not be around people. I, like, pull towards my dad. Right? And, and sometimes in order to do that, I have to go where there's, like, no distractions. You know? So, like, I went in the woods. And I just, I yelled. I remember I sat on my porch. And I told God. And I was honest, man. I was real with him, you know. I was like, you know, there's many times I didn't feel like doing what you asked me to. And I was obedient. <laughs> and I did it because I love you. I said, but man, I don't want to lose my wife. Like, I don't want to lose her. And then I said it again, like, like I don't want to lose her. And then I said it even louder. And then I sat there. And then I said, you know, you brought me through this. <laughs> I started stacking stones. Right? I started stacking stones. Right? I, I said, you, you brought me through this. You brought me through this. You, when, when I was in prison, you kept me safe. You guarded my mind. You brought me a deeper relationship with you. When I went through this, you were there. Like, I just started stacking stones. Right? Sometimes you got to stack stones. Sometimes when the cards look like they're against you, you just got to be like St. Patrick and go, you know what? Jesus above me. Jesus below me. Jesus to my right, to my left. He's underneath me. He's, come on, I'm surrounded by you. And it may look like I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by you, Right? The Bendigo, how you say his name, babe? Yeah, Meshach, Shadrach. In in the bed you go, right? <laughs> they were steadfast. They were steadfast in their faith. They never wavered. Like even even looking at the fire, they like never wavered. I've seen my wife go, go through things, not just her physically, but things with family, things with just, and she never wavered. These guys were asked to worship something else. They were steadfast. They never wavered. 
when I got out of prison, like I, I had a bunch of my friends that were trying to pull me back and trying to pull me back, right? And like I knew I wasn't strong enough to, to, to fight that temptation, right? So I just had to get wisdom. I'm like, okay, God, like I know you want to save them, and I know we're, like I've been where they're at, and um, I, I'd like to, and he said, not yet. He said, not yet. He says, once I get you to where the fire no longer burns you, then I can send you into the fire to pull others out. Right? It, if, uh, Pull up James um, 1, 1 through 27. I'm going to go to, yeah. Seven hundred times. Like the king had the furnace turned up. Just worship. What, what do you think these dudes are facing? Like, and all you got to do is worship the king. It was the wrong king. You know, James and John, the sons of thunder, um, their mom, <laughs> they must have had a helicopter mom huh? that just hovered around. And I'm going to make sure my boys get theirs, right? I'm just going to make sure my boys get theirs. This Jesus dude, where's this Jesus dude? Can my son sit on your right hand? Huh? He didn't even address her. He looked at the sons. He said, can you drink from my cup of suffering? Like, like, can you drink from my cup of suffering and not lose faith and not lose sight of the end goal? James, a servant of God and Lord Jesus Christ, says, Count it all joy when you fall into manifold temptations, knowing that the proving of your faith works patience. So when you get tempted, count it joy, but don't fall into the temptation. Right? says, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. For he that doubt is like a surge of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed to and fro, right? So if I have doubt, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So what he's saying is, is like if, if you have your eyes on the earth and your eyes on the kingdom, but you're being swayed, you're taking your eyes. It says don't. It says, keep your eye on the kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. What are these things? Kingdom things, righteous things. If I have my eye on the world, what am I looking for? Worldly things, right? It says, count it all joy. And then it says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God who gives to all liberally and unbridled, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not doubting. We'll go down to verse 9. But let the brother of lower degree glory in his high estate, and the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower or the grass of the grasses, he shall pass away. For the sun arises with scorching wind and withers the grass, and the flower therefore falls, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. 
so also shall the rich man fade away in his goings. But blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to them that love him. And let no man say when he is tempted that I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempteth no man. But each man is tempted when he is drawn away by his whose lust? His own lust and enticed. Then the lust, when it had conceived, what he's saying here is you get a thought in your head that's not like righteous. You, you get a thought and then you start to think on it. And, it. and it doesn't have to be, it can be as simple as, you know what, I wish that I wish that, that person right there would just, you understand what I'm saying? Like somebody cuts you off because they're going really fast and they jump in front of you and you're like, man, uh, get them cops. I hope the cops give them a ticket. I mean, it's just as simple as that, right? See, the word entertainment, right? If I entertain a thought that's not of him, I've allowed a thought that's not of him to enter into my mind, and then I contain it, right? And then I dwell on it and meditate on it, right? A until all of a sudden I'm acting upon it. So the best thing to do is when you get that thought and you realize, hey, this isn't good, like this isn't of him, and this is the old me, right? Or this is actually teenage mindset, right? You just stop. Just stop. If you have prayer language, pray in it. If not, you just say, you know what? It's a wrong thought. Just that right there is going to flip it. Just, just, just you going, you know what? That's a wrong thought. Because now all of a sudden your heart, in your heart, your sincerity is, you know what? That, that wasn't a good thought. That's a wrong thought. You're already taking a step to what? Taking that thought captive. And, and then you proclaim how you know it's a wrong thought. That's a wrong thought. Because the Lord says, because the Bible says, because God says, right? Because I've thought that way before, and it never produced the fruits of the Spirit. It never produced life, right? Right? Does that make sense? If I keep doing the same things over and over, expecting a different result, then that's insanity, right? But so many times I went back like a dog to vomit, thinking that, thinking that, oh, that's who I was supposed to, that's, and God has way more for you. E even if you think you're like right where you need to be right now, there's way more for you. See, because it says it goes from glory to glory to glory. Right? There, like your relationship with God right now, there's way more to it. It says, know this, my beloved. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, putting away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deluding your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and right away he forgets what kind of man he was. But he that looked into the perfect law, the law of liberty, freedom, the law of Jesus. He continues, being not a hearer that forgets, but a doer that works. This man shall be blessed in his doing. If any man think him, himself to be religious, while he doesn't bridle his tongue, deceives his heart. This man religion is in vain. 
pure religion undefiled before our God and Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Self-sanctification. Just to keep yourself unspotted. Steadfast, firmly fixed, not subject to change, firm in your belief, determination to be loyal, faithful, to be immovable, to be unyielding. It, it's not always a bed of roses. It's not. But when things come at you, if you have a foundation, of the word and you have a love for Christ and you press on to towards that and you don't give up and you persevere <laughs> steadfastness he crowns you with the righteousness of himself Now, I told, I told you in the beginning that I, I told God, I don't want to lose my wife. I don't want to lose her. And I was mad. Man, was I mad. <laughs> wasn't righteous anger. I, I wasn't mad at the sin. I was just mad. And I was mad at God. And I let him know. But he said, <laughs> you're not going to lose her. He said, you're not going to lose her. It's the only thing I had left to stand on. This is the only thing I had to stand on. And I remember telling God, look, <laughs> I don't want to be selfish. Like, I know this might be selfish, but I don't want to lose her. And then I justified it. Ah, her, I, I don't want her kids to have to go through this again. Because they lost her, their father to cancer. And, it, and it, the reality was I, was, I didn't want to lose her. The reality was that I was mad that that sh should even happen to her. Because my wife's a godly woman. She does amazing things for the Lord. That's who she is. But there was times when the doctor said things. And I just had to say, yeah, you have a boss. But my boss told me I wasn't going to lose her. There was times where she couldn't even get out of the bed to go do her next treatment. And I'd have to get her in the shower, get her in the car, sometimes put her in a wheelchair, wheel her in. There were so many times that I would make it about me. And I had to die to that. Riding home. And look, I don't want to tell her she's steadfast. So I hurried home, man. I hurried home, didn't I? I ran in the house. I said, guess what? Guess what? She said, what? I said, God said you're steadfast. She said, steadfast? What's that even mean? I said, I don't know, but he said, you're steadfast. She goes, what? I said, yeah, I, I, I just wanted a word to encourage you. I, I just wanted God to, like, give me a word that would just encourage you. He said, tell her she's steadfast.
She never lost faith. There was times I had to remind her of what the Lord told me. You're not going to lose her. But see, without relationship, I never would have heard that. If I would have went back to fishing for fish, I never would have heard that. The, the whole foundation of Christianity is based on the fact that each and every one of us, regardless of faith, denomination, color, intelligence, age, the foundation is that we can all hear from God through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, who do you say that I am? They all gave him different answers. I mean, there's about 30 or 40 people there. Peter asked, God, who do you say he is? Who is he, God? All of a sudden, he jumps out of You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the Savior of the world. And Jesus, addressing him by name, because there's others there, said, on this, Peter, I will build my church. He said, you only know this from hearing from the Spirit of God. On this, Peter, I'll build my church. What is the this? The fact that we can hear God. Um, go to... Go to Second Thessalonians 1, 1 through 12. Hope deferred is, is just the loss of hope that was once there, right? So hope deferred makes the heart grow weird, sick, right? So hope deferred is, is where there was once hope and now there's not. See, but we, we, get, we get to be the ones, right? that bring hope back to people, right? The hope of Jesus, right? You know, there was ten virgins, and, and five of them had oil. The other five didn't. But they knew they needed it. The first five said, hey, you know, we, we tried to give you the oil. You didn't want it, basically. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And you might not have understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't. I don't have full understanding of it. But it's, what it's, it's what's helped me persevere. It, it, it's, it's what's encouraged me when I couldn't encourage myself. It's what encouraged me when others that encouraged me, like I looked at them like they were just selling me a bag of goods. I mean, when you grow up in the street, you're kind of like weary of people. You know, you learn to read people quick. But it's the... Uh, it was the most important baptism. 
And it was the most important thing that Jesus had to say to his disciples because the last thing that he told them before he ascended was go until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, right? But before that, he said, I have to go. I have to go in order to give you the promise of the Father, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So here he is about to ascend to heaven. The last thing that he talks about is, I have to go in order to give you the promise of the Father, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Paul and Savannah and Timothy, under the church of Thessalonians, and God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you, peace from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Now you got to look at Paul. <laughs> Here was a man that was like, he was bent on the law, bent on killing Christians, and like his whole world gets rocked and turned around. And... He never asked anybody, were you baptized in the baptism of John? He said, were you baptized in the Holy Spirit? Because he knew the importance because that's what changed him. That's what opened his eyes to not only who Jesus is, but to who he was without Jesus, right? Okay. It says, we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, even as, as it is meet, for that your faith grow exceedingly. And the love of each one of you all towards one another abounds, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions which you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God to the end that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. For which you also suffer. If so, if so be th that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense affliction to them that afflict you, and to you that are afflicted, rest with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven, with the angels of his power in flaming fire, rendering vengeance to them that know not God, and to them that obey not the gospel. Who shall suffer punishment, even eternal destruction from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his might, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all them that believe, because our testimony unto you is believed. And we pray for you always that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire of your goodness and every work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. And you and him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you that to be steadfast. You don't have to be steadfast to a church. You don't have to be steadfast to a denomination. Be steadfast to him. If for the mere fact of what he's, what he's brought in you to, what he's brought in you from, stack stones. When you're tempted... Realize the temptation. If you have a prayer language, pray it. If you have a friend, call him. But more than that, take time to separate yourself from the temptation. Take the time to separate yourself from distraction, from the noise of the world, even if it's just like turning your car radio off. My wife can 
ask me something and I'll just be in my prayer closet and she'll ask me again and you might be in the car but I'm in my prayer closet she'll ask me again and are uh, you talking to me? It says pray in, in the spirit edifying yourself lifting yourself up The day after I found my wife on the floor on her face and I went and yelled at God and two days later I come home. It's early in the morning. I had to run somewhere. I come back to the house to get something. I walk in the house and she's worshiping. Now this is four days after getting news that, you know, she has a tumor that's been there for 20 years and, and that she could die. And uh, she's worshiping. I walk in the house, and I see her with her banners, and I'm like, I got mad again. And I said, you know what? Anger doesn't produce the righteousness of God. And I took my shoes off, and I grabbed a banner. My wife's got banners and flags, and, and I didn't want to worship. I had all these thoughts, how can I worship? And I said, you know what? I'm just going to sacrifice myself and my feelings and my anger, and I'm going to worship. And it might be ugly, but I'm going to worship. Because I, re I remember when you pulled me, pulled me out of this. I remember when you pulled me out of addiction. I remember when you pulled that lady out of the wheelchair. I remember when you gave that kid ears to hear and a mouth to speak. After being born deaf mute. So just think back. Just like take a moment. It's Thanksgiving. Remember what he's pulled you from. Remember what he's done for your kids. Remember what he's done for your family. Because that's how you persevere. When that is so far from your mind, and all you see is red. Remember who he is. Remember what you mean to him. <laughs>